attention, please. So that's not sufficient? Hey, hey guys! What? Pretend. All right. Welcome, everyone. And uh, it'll be a pleasure to introduce, even though Tony introduced our speaker, I'll do it again. But uh, speaking, of, speaking of Tony, he, he is uh, involved. There's a praise and worship uh, ministry. It's uh, Ashley Bro is the gentleman who leads the... Uh, the choir and the men's ministry at Contemporary Band. He's got a little, a little band. And uh, Saturday, this Saturday evening, 7 o'clock at the Bushler Center, he's going to be speaking. Tony's got tickets. Ashley's got a great voice, and his group is entertaining as well. So if you need to get some tickets, come to see Tony afterwards. It's Z88.3 type Christian music. Upbeat, very, you know, Matt Mayer, Matt Mar, and all those guys, yeah. Good stuff. Yep, very good. Been for a couple hours, so you get all kinds of music. Today we have a, a gentleman who's been here before. Uh, Walter has gained an additional notoriety because not only is he speaking here, but he is uh, he speaks what once a month or so on a radio station in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, he was up there last month. He probably will skip going up there in the winter time because it's so warm. <laughs> but uh, he, he might go up there. But anyway. I like to refer to what Walter's written. He's a good friend of mine. I think he is anyway. But he's written 17 Christian books. One of them is the Bible and politics, which of course is in play right now. And give you just a, a flavor on the kind of things that are in here. There's a little saying, and then he explains it, and then there's a scripture reading. Uh, one is uh, how can a politician claim something as common sense when they really display display such little of it? Some of you have to think of it. But anyway, most politicians don't know what they're doing, as we all know. But Walter has a great message today. Uh, please uh, welcome him up to the up to the podium here. Thanks, Doug. If there's anybody who's unemployed, I have two more of these books. You can take one with you. Okay. You know, Doug is right. We are friends. And, uh, you know, there are some people you can instantly look at them and uh, you can tell the gerbil is not running in the cage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that's true with Doug. I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> okay. I do appreciate the opportunity once again to, to be with you and, and to share. And um, you can figure out how to turn this on. subject today, topic, is God judging America? This is a rather serious question, one we dare not take lightly, because it's a fearsome thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. In today's message, I will briefly timeline ancient Israel in doing so, I'm going to be referring to three Old Testament prophets. I want to compare ancient Israel to America and then discuss the current situation in the United States and present what I am firmly convinced is the only solution to America's problem. When I read a scripture, and there'll be a lot of them in order to set the stage to answer the original question, try to see how those verses apply to America in your own mind. Now, <clears throat> before we begin, uh, I'd like to open up with a word of prayer. So if you would join with me. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth 
will be directed by your spirit for your glory and not my flesh. And ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. The Israelites' rebellion and failure to maintain covenant with God resulted in the nation splitting into the northern and the southern kingdoms, Israel and Judah, respectively. Originally, the nation was united from 1050 to 935 BC. It's about 115 years. Then it was divided from 935 to 586, 349 year period. The northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians in 722, and then the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom in 586. Why is that important? Think about what I said. Everything I say, start thinking Israel, the United States, Israel, the United States. The prophet Hosea ministered to the northern kingdom about 750 to 722 BC. Outwardly, the nation was enjoying a time of prosperity and growth, but inwardly, moral corruption and spiritual adultery had permeated the people. Hosea had a threefold ministry. One, God abhorred the sins of his people. Two, judgment was certain. And three, God's love for his people remained loyal and firm. Hosea 4, 6 reads, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me, because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. So said the Lord. In referring to Israel's apostasy, the Lord said, They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. What a whirlwind we have going today. Amen. Relative to Israel's sin and captivity, Hosea wrote, You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way. In the multitude of your mighty men, therefore, tumor shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be plundered. Now the prophet Joel ministered in the final decade of the 6th century BC. <clears throat> Without a warning, disaster struck the southern kingdom of Judah in the form of an ominous black cloud. The dreaded locusts. Jose or Joel 1 tells us that nothing was spared. The locusts had ravaged everything. That plague was God's judgment because of the sin of his people. God often used then, and he still does now, natural disasters as punishment for the sins of men. Whereas the course of nature and nations are under God's control, they are subject to his righteous judgment and justice. Now as horrific as the locust was, it will pale in comparison to God's judgment on the coming day of the Lord, as we know in Scripture. In Joel 2, we read, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. In other words, look at the deeper things, not the superficial, and turn back to God. Furthermore, in Joel 2, we read, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, and my people shall never be put to shame, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
know that God still wanted his people to repent in order to bless them. Even though Amos was a citizen of the southern kingdom of Judah, he ministered in the northern kingdom of Israel, as did Hosea. During that time, Israel was encountering a period of a national optimism. Business was booming and foundries were bulging. Nevertheless, below the surface, greed and injustice were festering and boiling. Ritual replaced true worship, thereby establishing a false sense of security and a growing callousness with regard to God's discipline. Neither famine, drought, plagues, death, nor destruction were able to force and drive the people to their needs in repentance. <coughs> Sound familiar? Recognizing the reality and nearness of God's judgment, Amos lashed out at the people and their sin in an attempt to mobilize them to repent. Yet, because of the nation's hypocrisy and spiritual apathy, she sat like a bowl of rotting fruit, defiant and inviting the judgment of God. <coughs> Five times in Amos 4, the Lord said, Yet you have not returned to me. Then in Amos 5, the Lord told his people to seek him and to live. In Amos 8, God said, Behold, the days are coming that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. And we know that God will not be mocked, nor will he share his glory with anyone. So let's briefly compare the path of America to ancient Israel. For example, both are covenant nations. They have worldviews that were based on the principles, precepts, and law of God. They were a called out people. Israel from Egypt, the United States from Europe. They were appointed and anointed by God, whereby Israel was to introduce to the rest of the world the one true God. America was called to disseminate the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be the light on the hill to spread the word. Both were blessed by God have impacted the world for the glory of God, have had cycles of repentance, prosperity, apathy, rebellion, and rejection of God, only to start the cycle all over again. Because God, in his grace and his mercy, hears the cry of his people. They experienced numerous natural disasters that were instigated by God. They were and are being punished by Eastern warriors. Herein I would invite you to read Habakkuk 1. They have been and are being corrupted by foreign gods. Remember, I'm comparing Israel and the United States. They have redefined God's laws as find in Isaiah 5, 20, where up is down, sweet is sour, sour is sweet, right is wrong, wrong is right. And they have killed their children, both the born and the unborn. And they have false prophets going through society, spewing lies, claiming to be a prophet of the Lord. And God says, I never gave you those words. Now let's shift our focus to America and look at some of the signs of the times. Our Christian worldview is being swallowed by postmodernism. And this is an entire subject that I'd love to address to you then 
and it later gave postmodernism. It's killing us. Political upheaval is spread throughout the nation. Threats of economic collapse and civil war are threatening our very existence. An avalanche of political correctness is redefining our entire culture. Acute immorality is leading us down the path to amorality. Fear is dictating and controlling the lives of many. And I might add, for those who know Christ, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world, and we don't have to fear because we know fear is not of God. We know who wins. We know where we're going. But what do we do in the meantime? An entitlement mentality has assassinated the core of ambition. Many are unwilling to assume or accept responsibility. Like the morning dew, an unbridled apathy has blanketed our land. The pursuit of money, power, and sex for personal gratification is rampant. There's an overall decay and downward spiral of our society. We're actually living in a period akin to the judges of the Old Testament where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. <clears throat> and while the church has grown cold, indifferent, and ineffective, she is no longer setting the standard, calibrating the moral barometer, because she has become so much like the world. It's hard to differentiate between the world and the church in some places. In Exodus 19, God said to Moses atop Mount Sinai, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to my side. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, Israel's election and designation as chosen was not necessarily conditioned on their ethnicity alone, but on their commitment to be true to God's call and live according to the faith handed down to them by Abraham. Their purpose, as we said, was to faithfully represent God to all the nations in the hope that they might seek and turn those nations from their gods to the one true living God. Similarly, America's forefathers could be seen as having formed a covenant with God as well. For example, the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact. Read it, and you will see the depth of commitment that these men and women had and established the bedrock of this nation. William Bradford's writings of Plymouth Plantation, Winthrop's writings, a model of Christian charity, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, along with a myriad of other writings of our founding fathers, many, I dare say, most of whom were Christians, although the current Reconstructionists of history would deny that because their agenda is to destroy this nation's Christian heritage. Here is a truth. America was founded and rooted on the basis of Judeo-Christian principles and precepts, and that includes our judicial system. But whereas Israel's <coughs> and failure 
to keep God's covenant resulted in her downfall, so America's rebellion and failure will eventually bring about her downfall. God will not be mocked. Scripture is clear that God is both gracious and merciful in that he will send prophets and harbingers of warning prior to loosing his wrath and judgment. In Amos 3, 7, we read, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. I believe it's important here to recognize that this verse applies only to those whom God anoints and appoints as a prophet, not to those who are self-appointed and self-anointed. According to scripture, a prophet must be 100% correct 100% of the time. Otherwise, he or she is not to be feared or followed. According to scripture, that's not me. Some claim that a prophet can miss it. Well, you know, he's, he's young. He's just, he's a developing prophet. Quite frankly, I find no scripture that supports that supposition. I would ask the question, why would God entrust his plans to someone who might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing? That's not the way God operates. Given the above information, then we can be assured that God will judge America. The question now is when. Some contend that God's judgment of America has already begun. And herein, I tend to agree. Let's take a broad look at the last 50 years of our history. In the 1960s, the God is Dead movement began to sweep across this nation. SCOTUS, rule of SCOTUS, S-C-O-T-U-S, Supreme Court of the United States. SCOTUS rulings restricting religious freedoms form a trajectory for the law. You may recall we had a speaker, uh, John Hostetler uh, was here a couple weeks ago. And by the way, he and I got together for breakfast the next day and we had a rather long discussion. Whereas he said the Supreme Court just gives opinions and uh, that's it. And I said, well, you know what? doesn't work that way because their opinions form the trajectory for the law that the rest of the nation is driven by. In 1950s, there were three decisions. Perhaps one of the more important was a New York law prohibiting commercial showing of any film deemed sacrilegious was found unconstitutional. In the 60s, there were 11 decisions impacting, perhaps the most important of which you may recall in 1962 when we removed prayer and Bible reading from public schools. In 1970, there were nine decisions, and of course the most infamous of which is the 1973 Roe v. Wade, which has resulted in the killing the killing and murdering of millions of children. And we think it's all right. In the 1980s, there were 17 decisions, one of which was the displaying of a nativity scene or a menorah on county property. And that came back with a mixed decision. In the 1990s, there were five decisions. In 92, prayer at public school graduations was declared unconstitutional. And then in the 2000s, we all know the most horrific 
decision that could possibly have been made in June of last year when the court sanctioned homosexual marriage. Amen. And the Bible speaks a lot against homosexuality. It's clear that America continues to expunge all mention of and dependence upon God. We got it, God. We can take care of it. <clears throat> Whereas God will not remain where he is not wanted. When he departs, he takes with him his blessing and his protection and thereafter will follow his judgment. As additional evidence that God has removed his hedge of protection and is judging America, I offer the following for your consideration. Warnings of God's judgment emerged in the early 70s, thereby loosing his progressive judgment upon America through the 80s and the 90s. And believe me, I had to go through mounds and mounds of material there was so much I wanted to say, but I had to distill it. So there's a lot of detail left out here. 9-11 was a laser shot across the bow, signaling and calling this nation to repentance. And you know, we did for three days. The market crash of 2008 was another harbinger of God's pending judgment upon this nation. <clears throat> Since the SCOTUS ruling of homosexual marriage, weather-related patterns across America have been almost apocalyptically violent. And that is documented. Our economies in shambles, indicative of a sharp decline ahead. Listen to this, in 1929, the debt to GDP ratio was 16%. Debt to GDP, in other words, if our debt's higher than our GDP, that means we are spending more, we owe more than we can actually pay. There's ways out of that, but we won't go into that. And then in 2015, the debt to GDP was 101%, and it's going higher. Since January of 2008, the national debt doubled, and it shows no signs of slowing. Our military is the smallest it's been in decades. It's having difficulty with equipment, maintaining it, getting the parts, staffing, mobilization. It's being gutted. We're constantly being attacked in cyberspace. And we're constantly being challenged in the Middle East, even globally. Our global hegemony is rapidly diminishing. Our enemies no longer fear us, and our allies do not trust us, nor do they have any respect for us. Politically, we are in a total disarray, fractionalized to the point of civil war. Tenets of Islam have infiltrated and having detrimental impact on our government, educational, financial, military, judicial, and yes, even our prison system. Truly, we in this nation are facing multiple existential threats because we told God to leave us alone, we've lost our moral moorings while simultaneously rapidly becoming a godless and lawless society. Personally, I think we've achieved those. These are but a few examples of how America is in decline. There should be no doubt that we have lost the culture war. Why? I would contend very forcefully 
because we in America have divorced the family of Isaac and married into the family of Ishmael. Do you understand what I'm saying? Isaac represents God's people, God's promise, God's covenant. Ishmael is the exact opposite. Remember, they were, they were brothers. Ishmael was cursed, and the Bible said he will be at contention, at enmity with his brothers forever. <laughs> and that is exactly what we're seeing in the Middle East. Is constant war. And so we, instead of remaining with God's covenanted people, we have divorced ourselves from them and married into this mess. And there are going to be consequences. As I interpret the signs of the times, Western society, as we have known, is in the final countdown leading to a total collapse and self-destruction. And what's interesting here is that many biblical end time scholars claim that the United States must fall in order for the Antichrist to be ushered in. Depending on whom you ask, some say anywhere from 25 to 33 percent of scripture deals with prophecy. So in order to understand the times, we must understand biblical prophecy. And to understand the future, we've got to understand the past relative to scripture. Only as we understand the times in accordance with God's word will we be able to link the past and the future. If we don't look up expectantly, because the Bible says, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. If we don't look up expectantly, we won't be able to tolerate looking around. It's getting harder and harder to do, to do that even now. God alone is in control. Not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not Congress, or the courts. So what's the answer? What do we do? What must America do to thwart these existential threats <coughs> to our very existence? <coughs> First and foremost, if God is to stay, to hold off God's judgment, she needs to fall to her knees in repentance. But such repentance must begin with the church. And guess what? That means you and that means me. We are the church. We don't have to go into a building with a cross on top to be in church. We're in church right here. I've had church many times down at Sebastian Inlet talking to a man while we're fishing. And God's presence fell. The church is where you are if you are in the spirit. Second Chronicles 4.17, which you may have heard over and over again, but let me tell you, it is the only key that will solve our problems because it says, if my people who are called by my name, and this is God speaking now, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven and will fill, uh, forgive their sin and will heal their land. That is a conditional promise, gentlemen, that begins with the church seeking the face of God, repenting and humbling themselves. And what that means very simply is when you go home 
or you go to your car or wherever you find convenience, you get down on your knees before God and you repent of your sin, ask God's forgiveness, ask the Lord to create in you a clean heart and renew a right spirit within you that you might go and do what God has called you to go and do for his glory and not your own. And as you go, you will have an influence and an impact on other people's lives. Gentlemen, this is serious business. We are in the final days of the final days. There is no more time left. The Lord could come back instantly. It may be delayed, but it doesn't matter. You and I need to make sure that we have our hearts right before God and then make sure that our families are right. And when we are right with God, then we can go out and help others to be right with God. So that puts the responsibility squarely on our shoulders. In other words, my shoulders your shoulders if my people who are called by my name we are Christians we are called by his name we are his people therefore that's what we need to do so what will you do how will you live from this day forward Will you die to self and live for Christ? Will you finish well the race that God has set before you? My decision has been made. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we've heard your word. Now may our actions and our words be in accordance with the truth of your word that we may go and do what you have called us to do, rejoicing in the knowledge that greater is he in us and he who is in the world, such that all we do and all we say will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. over there if anybody's interested and I've got a couple of these left if you know anybody or if you yourself are unemployed please take a copy it's free beside that I don't want to take them home anymore great thank you thank you very much for that wonderful message it's very timely with what's going on in the world today I got to be in the camera I'm sorry I don't want to be a celebrity <laughs> anyway, it's a great time to message. Next week we have another a gentleman who has been here also before, uh, Dan Walker from Love Inc. Does anyone know what Love Inc. stands for? Love in the name of Christ. Everybody's mighty name. Anyway, what, what Love Inc. has done in this community is, uh, and it's part of what Walter was talking about, what can, what's God's message to us? He has worked with and organized, mobilized, I think it's 15 churches, 15 dollars, anyway, 15 churches in Brevard County. And the whole purpose is to be the hands and feet of Christ in the community. Exactly what Walter was talking about. We need to get out and do the work that God has laid out for us. 
So next week coming here, Dan Walker. Again, we ask you guys to be generous to Sonny's. They're generous to us. So open your wallet to leave a little, leave a little extra. We got a few short people today. Not short people, but short. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys all for coming.